Frederick Chopin was born on March 1st, 1810, in a small country house in Jelazova Vola, about 40 miles from Warsaw. It was here that his father, Nicola, a French schoolmaster expatriated when he was 17, married Justina Krzyżanowska, a Polish orphan related to an aristocratic family, the Skarbeks. Today, every Sunday, pianist of Polish or international renown is invited by the Chopin National Institute to give a recital in the salon of the composer's birthplace. The tradition, which I respected, has the pianist playing unseen inside the house while the music drifts through the open doors and windows into the surrounding park.
Chopin's years growing up in Warsaw were a mixture of hard work and good times. His family home was constantly filled with eminent scientists, musicians, poets, and scholars. And Frederick's reputation as a prodigy also opened the doors of the Polish aristocracy. At the age of 10, he has already finished his piano lessons. I have nothing left to teach him, regretted his professor, Adalbert Zuvnia. Four years later, he embarked on his serious study of composition under Joseph Elsner at the Warsaw Conservatory. From the beginning, he refused to adhere to the classical rules and went his own way. To those who criticized this independence, Elsner replied, let him alone. True, he does not follow the usual paths, but then his talent is not usual either. Chopin drew great inspiration from local folk music and dances, and his deep feelings for Poland permeated all his creative output. Chopin was very interested. He was tremendously interested in the theater. He had probably attended the opening nights of most theater that came to Warsaw. Uh, loved, loved theater. Um, he was, in fact, a tremendously good man, which is something which he uh, uh, did all of his life to the amusement of his friends. And he did quite a bit of acting here in Poland. He and his sister uh, wrote a play and acted in this play and were so very were so good at it that one of the leading uh, uh, polish actors said to to chopin i think you want to stop all this piano playing stop all this writing for the piano and become an actor that's how good he was uh, he also loved singing he loved the opera he went to the opera as much as he could and he loved the human voice which is a very important part of the music of Chopin. 
he really tried, I believe, in his melodic, in his melody, melodic writing, to imitate that human voice. And you know, he always said to his students, you know, don't practice so much on the piano, but go and listen to good singers, and then you'll learn how to phrase a good melody. <laughs> The struggle of the Poles to achieve a national identity is well demonstrated by the succession of revolutions and wars that besieged Warsaw. Contemporary Warsaw, which has been completely rebuilt, still displays large photographs in the windows of most shops illustrating its state of collapse at the end of the Second World War. In 1967, while traveling in France, I was invited with my wife to the Chateau de Troiry near Paris, the home of my friend the Count Antoine de La Penouse. It was here that I discovered two manuscripts which I immediately recognized as unknown versions of two Chopin waltzes, the G-flat major and the famous E-flat major. They were found lying in an 18th century trunk between letters and old clothing belonging to an ancestor, Delphine de la Penouse, to whom Chopin gave them as a gift in 1833. By an extraordinary coincidence, five years later at Yale University in the United States, I accidentally unearthed two further versions of the very same waltzes again in Chopin's hand.
Grand Vaux Brillant, probably the most famous of Chopin's waltzes. One, one waltz that he wrote really for dancing. Uh, the year version that I found of this waltz is an earlier version than the Tuari version <clears throat> and has some startling differences from the published version. For instance, the very beginning of this waltz, which starts with this fanfare. <clears throat> one, one trumpet announcing the dance. In the earlier version, Chopin had another idea. Later on, this... That's the published version. The Yale version, he has a stop. He doesn't, he doesn't continue it. Then he goes on to do something which is rather modern, almost jazzy, I think, in this passage. This is the published version. Now, the Yale version. Then he goes on the middle of this waltz. In the published version, it goes something like this. And so on and so on. Then in the in the yellow version, he does something different. He does this. Wonderful left hand. He changes the character and he writes dolente, sadly, with sorrow, with pain. Then, listen to this, this difference. published version. The published version. So he's changed the rhythm.
intensely disliked giving large public performances. And during his lifetime, he played a surprisingly small number of about 30 concerts. In a letter to Liszt, he explained, the audiences embarrass me. I feel suffocated by their breathing, paralyzed by their inquiring eyes, and dumb in front of their strange faces. But you are made for public playing, and if you can't win them over, at least you can stun them with acrobatics. For Chopin, whose physique was particularly frail and who was a victim of stage fright, a concert was an endurance test to be avoided whenever possible. Chopin, at the age of 20, left Warsaw never to return. Although he once remarked that he was not interested in local praise, Frederick's life in Paris would always be haunted by memories of Poland, his family, and the friends of his childhood. Things did not go well for him at first in France, and for a while he thought of leaving for America. But his reputation as a pianist grew swiftly and shortly assured him of a teaching career. He earned his living in Paris by giving lessons to wealthy and for the most part untalented aristocrats for today's equivalent of $20 per hour. One of his pupils, a young boy named Filch, was, had studied with Liszt, and he writes to his parents one day, he said, you know, working with Liszt is incredible, great experience, but working with Chopin is incomparable. One of his great, greatest points was equality of playing, equality of sound. He said something very beautiful. He was not one of the school who said, you know, work each one of those fingers. You know, not, don't work each one of those fingers so they become equal in strength. Each finger has its own job to do. Don't try to make them all even. A very, uh, very interesting concept. Let me show you this exercise that he would give. First he said, this, these were the notes he said, to put your hands on. Not the straight, but leaned a little bit to the side, which is a normal position in which your hand is put, really, when it's on a piano. So he would start by giving this exercise. In both hands, left hand, just lightly and evenly. Another touch, a little more sustained. Then, that way. And always saying, always saying facilement, easily, 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 never any tension. And then, at the end, get control in both forte playing, which means loud playing, as well as in soft playing. Very important uh, to keep when you play softly. You need as much control as you do when you play loudly. So that was one exercise that he, that he used. Another, uh, he had the feeling that the hand should be always kept with a minimum of motion, no matter what you did minimal motion, so he gave this exercise. No matter how you move, not, we, we, what he didn't want to happen was this. So the hand moves, you see, like that. He wanted to keep it, keep it straight. Keep it straight. It's a very, very, very good training. Uh, so you can bend the rules later, but first you must learn the rules. And this he knew very well. Uh, so he was very, very strong about that.
was probably during the autumn of 1836 in Paris that Chopin met Georges Sand for the first time. Their meeting sparked off one of the most widely publicized and intriguing love affairs of the 19th century.